I'm a little bit more of a science person. Boss, how would you describe yourself? I'm more of an engineering person. And what we typically do is we, our employer gets us these Fridays, and we're, we're allowed to do whatever we want, like once a month, do whatever. And our favorite hobby is to over-engineer a funny problem. Um, so, boss, uh, <laughs> yes. um, Oh, sure, yeah, but, uh, we'll do that when they, so I see that the laptop has now been moved upstairs, so that should be fine. Ah, okay, grand. Well, we'll just, okay, we'll, we'll now do the thing where we sort of stand in the middle here. Um, but what I'm about to tell you is a story about an algorithm, and there's a very cool and highly applicable part of the algorithm, and there's a not so applicable part about the algorithm. But there's something very general that we discovered that we're actually pretty damn proud of. Um, what I will say, though, is I wouldn't approach it the way that we did. Grand. Okay, so there's a button uh, at the top. Um, but, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, play. All the way at the top. Nope. 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 Left. Left. Again, this, this is what is messing up the timing. So, uh, what we'll do is when I do... Yay! So... Um, boss, if we wave, that's when we want the next slide, right? Yeah, let's, correct. Uh, let's do that. Okay, so let's see if this works. <laughs> you can press space bar. Hey! Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. We had a slight technical error, but we'll make it work. Um, what, I'll, what we'll be talking about today is a silly problem that we're going to over-engineer. And when I say over-engineer, I mean over-engineer in all caps. This is a card game that I usually love playing. However, that's my lovely girlfriend, and my lovely girlfriend typically wins. Very typically, she wins. She actually wins quite often. Um, and this got me thinking. I bought this book called Real World Algorithms. And as my girlfriend was sort of counting how many points she got and I didn't, uh, I figured out, let's maybe use an algorithm here. Can I use an algorithm uh, to get better at this card game? So the goal is, we we're going to we're gonna find a helpful algorithm. This seems like an easy problem. Surely we can solve with an algorithm. Uh, if need be, I'll borrow my boss's credit card for any cloud resources I might need. I'll learn from it, and then I'll probably profit, win from my girlfriend once in a while. That'd be, that'd be totally that'd be nice. This game of Sushi Go, though, it can get quite deep. Um, and the small thing, like, we have to keep it simple. I want to get better at the card game myself without the aid of a laptop. Um, my girlfriend would really think it's cheating if at every decision I need to make, I need to consult the terminal. I think that's fair, right? It's, it's, so none of that voodoo reinforcement deep learning kerfuffle. I'm not going to do any of that. Um, so also another reason to keep it simple, I know who I am. I'm going to over-engineer it anyway. I'll find help with the over-engineering. So we really want to try and keep it simple because we're going to make it over-engineering anyway. So again, this is the card game and just the gist of it, what the computer science problem is. Um, these are the cards that you can play. And I just want to figure out which cards are better than others. So I have a list of all the card names. And the only thing I want is I want that list to be in the right order. The best card should be in one end, the worst card should be in the other end, and everything needs to be ordered correctly. And if you want to do that, you know, you need a way to simulate an order. So I've got this function, the code's not too important, but you can put an order of cards in there, and I can simulate a bunch of times against a random player, and that'll be my score function. So uh, I want to optimize the order, this is how I'm going to optimize, this is what says if an order is better or worse. Unfortunately, I've got 14 cards, so that's quite a lot of combinations. And if you think about it, um, this is very similar to the traveling salesman problem. The traveling salesman problem is also ordering cities in which you're going to visit. So I already knew this, like winning from my girlfriend was going to be hard, but this implies that winning a card game is NP hard. So, okay. You, you can smell the overengineering from a distance at this stage. Um, however, and this is sort of a thing that I want to give you when, before you go home. We now know it's an NP hard problem, but it doesn't mean that we should stop thinking. Sure, we've got lots and lots of combinations here, but maybe we can think and make the problem already a bit easier. And the thing is, yes, these are the cards, but I play this game well enough that I do know that some cards are inherently worth less than other cards. You can read that from the rule book. You don't have to, like if you don't know anything, you might not know this, but just from reading the rule book, I do know that if there's ever an order in which an egg is worth more than a squid, that order is already wrong, so I shouldn't even consider that. Now if you take this into account, 
then already the number of combinations decreases by quite a bit. It's at a 36 like, speed up if you look at it that way. And that is one lesson at least. Like we're, we still have you know, quite a few combinations left. But this small little thought, this small little, hey, before I do any sort of code, can I, oops. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, the hardware is being patched at the moment. Um, but if I have any form um, of thought that I can put in before I do any code, this is a 36 speed up. This saves me 36 the amount of processing power. Never forget to think before you code. More people should do this. So even with this reduction, you know, it's kind of a lot of compute I probably got to do still. Um, it's not a small search space. And what makes it worse, uh, it's not that I only have to search there, but I got to simulate a whole lot. For every one of those combinations, if I'm going to do brute force, I need to simulate like at least 5,000 times to get a reasonably uh, accurate score metric. So, okay, how about I'm just going to do uh, a 101 on evolutionary heuristics. I'm not going to brute force it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, here's a couple of orders. I've simulated them. I've got scores. What I'll do is I'll throw away the bad ones, keep the good ones. And what I'll do is I'll try to uh, take the ones that are good and make more uh, orders that are like it, but a little bit different. If I repeat this a whole bunch of times, you might recognize this as sort of the genetic way of doing it. You will come to a cool conclusion that the green parts, the stuff that's heavy, that's where all the simulation happens, that's embarrassingly parallel. So that bit, we can do some scaling. Yeah, and then uh, it helps if you've got an engineer. <laughs> um, so we found a solution, and Boss will tell you a bit more about it. It's, un it's a bit unconventional. It's marketed for a totally different purpose. Um, but we actually got something to work here, and Boss will tell you a little bit more about that. OK. Yeah, next slide. All right, so how to get this working in a nice way? Uh, Vincent showed with some simple mathematical tricks. You can get the search space down from 87 something billion down to 2 billion uh, possible combinations. But it's still quite a lot of combinations. If you were going to brute force all the possible combinations to find the best order to win your card game, uh, let's say a single simulation takes uh, 0.1 second, you're still going to be waiting for over seven years. So it's not very optimal. And uh, we needed a bit, there, a bit uh, better way to uh, uh, do all these simulations. So. There's a lot of ways to uh, approach this problem. Uh, before this uh, whole little project, we haven't worked with uh, Lambdas before, and we thought, hey, we need a lot of CPU power for this. And uh, Amazon has a service called Lambda nowadays. Uh, so let's try to use it for this uh, use case. Uh, so it's a compute service that lets you run code without uh, provisioning or managing servers. What it means, um, you upload your code or your function uh, to Amazon and Amazon will deal with all the managing and uh, scaling and provisioning of this service. So it doesn't matter if you have um, one request going there every now and then or a million requests, Amazon will do all the scaling of your Lambda function. So it's a bit like this. Uh, you have your Lambda function. At some point, you're going to make a request and the request is going to return to you. Next moment, you want to run a lot of simulations. And the nice thing about Lambdas is it scales almost instantly. So uh, straight away you have uh, your access over uh, 1,000 Lambdas. There's a lot of ways to uh, trigger it. Um, so with a Lambda, you upload uh, your function in, and, uh, into a Lambda function, but you need a way to call this Lambda function. Uh, so Amazon provides you a couple of ways to do so. Um, so SNS, SQ, SQs. Um, you can also call it over HTTP, and Amazon has another service for this called the API, API Gateway. So you have your, yeah, so let's, let's say this is Vincent. He makes an API call to uh, the API Gateway. Um, we have an endpoint there called Simulate, and this will make the call to your Lambda function. It will run your simulation and then return your result. Uh, the API Gateway is basically like... Um, uh, endpoint uh, where you can add uh, um, like a REST API. So besides simulate, you can just add your own functionality behind it. And API Gateway will do uh, many management things for you. Uh, so let's say your endpoint somehow leaks to the internet and you get DDoSed. 
uh, API, the API gateway will uh, uh, manage this for you and do some throttling on all the traffic. Um, anybody who's ever worked with Amazon before knows uh, how you, you have to go clicking around in the UI or if you want to uh, set it up uh, automated. Yeah, you have to learn some cloud formation or some other deployment tool, which uh, might take a bit of time, um, which you might not want to do if you have this cool problem you want to work on. So there is a tool for that. It's called Chalice. Uh, Chalice is a CLI tool to create applications using lambdas and gateways, and it can also do some other things. Uh, what this allows you to do, um, so let's uh, start with a hello world example. Uh, first you run pip install chalice, and you will get access to the chalice uh, command line tool. Um, let's create a hello world application with chalice new project hello world. What this does, it creates a hello world directory for you with some, basically a skeleton project for you. So there's a hello world directory uh, with an app.py in there. This app.py contains your API. Uh, there's a, uh, yeah, get ignore and requirements file. And there's a dot chalice directory. This contains the metadata of your Lambda function. So once you deploy your um, Lambda function with chalice, it will store the metadata of your function in there, and it's, which is nice because you can check this into Git and then share the same Lambda function with your colleagues. So when you run chalice deploy, a couple of things happen. It will patch the directory into a zip and it will upload it to Amazon. So that's a deployment package. It will do some uh, stuff like creating IAM policies and rules for you. Um, it will register a Lambda function at the Amazon side, create a REST API, which is this API gateway, and then we'll deploy the whole thing. Uh, the last line, you see this REST API URL. And this is the public endpoint which you can use to call your Lambda function. This is what the app.py looks like. So it has a bit of the feeling of a Flask uh, app. Uh, most important part is the app.route decorator. So this route is like a magic uh, thing in Chalice. It creates a API gateway endpoint for you, in this case on the, the route, and it will map every call to that endpoint to this function which you have below it. It allows you to define multiple uh, routes and uh, you can uh, very easily create a nice little uh, API uh, endpoint in the cloud. And it's nice because you can basically deploy this thing with a uh, touch, uh, with uh, just running on the command line and you don't need to worry about managing servers or whatever and it scales automatically. Uh, one last tool to introduce. Uh, so on the client side, we have Lambdas and API gateways with Chalice. On the local side, um, we wanted to use a tool called Fire. Fire is a tool to create uh, very simple command line interfaces. So let's say you have a script with some functions and um, you want to convert this into a command line tool. Uh, with Fire, it's super easy. So you have your main uh, if name equals main. In there, you define uh, your, basically your mapping between the commands from your command line tool to functions in your script. So in this case, we have two commands, hi and simulate, and they map to hello and simulate. And the arguments for these functions automatically get mapped into flags in your command line tool. So with just a click of a button, we now have a command line tool which can run simulation. Uh, let's say in this case, we give it uh, 10 uh, workers and then, well, let's scale this up a little bit. And now we have, uh, just by changing the number of simulations to 900, we have 900 calls to our Lambda functions. Uh, so very cool. So let's uh, kind of, uh, let's try to uh, abuse these Lambdas. So for iron range, many, many uh, simulations, let's go and simulate. It's not, not very feasible, because what it's gonna do, it's gonna call uh, your Lambda function, We'll wait, 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 wait until the simulation is done and get back to you. And we'll do this back and forth over two billion times. So obviously that's gonna take a very, very, very long time. And um, you don't want to be waiting that long. So there's a couple of ways to um, do multiple jobs simultaneously. Um, 
You can do uh, multi uh, some multi-threading uh, stuff. Uh, but today we're going to look into async I/O. So we run on a single thread, but we're going to want to run tasks concurrently. Um, just to set the context, here's a synchronous example. Um, we have a long task. Let's say this is our simulation in which we, in this case, sleep. We call this five times. And then at the end, we're going to print how long this takes. Well, very uh, straightforward. So what, would, what, work, uh, what happens is we do a call to our sleep function. It's going to sleep and then print process task zero. This goes back and forth five times. And in the end, we see completed in five and a little bit seconds. Now, asynchronous example with async I.O. Uh, so there's a couple new magic keywords you get with async I.O. Uh, but the main, the, the biggest thing you need to do is uh, on line 12, you have to instantiate this event loop. So this runs on a single thread. And this is basically like a scheduler. Uh, you add tasks to this uh, event loop. And the task will tell you uh, with the async and await keywords. They will indicate to these to this event loop when the event loop can go and run other tasks. So let's say you have this sleep function, and uh, you, with the await keyword, you can tell the event loop, hey, I'm now going to sleep. But in the meantime, you can go and do other stuff. So in this example, what will happen? It will start these five. Uh, it will call this long, long task for five times. But they're all going to say, hey, I just started. But uh, in the meantime, this event loop can go process other stuff. At some point in time, my uh, main process of execution will return to me. Um, and the nice thing about it is that you can tr basically trigger these uh, asynchronous tasks at the same time, and then they will return to you in, uh, at the, uh, almost at the same time. Uh, so you see they complete in about a second. And there's one thing to note with asynchronous programming you don't know when task will return to you. So yeah, let's say you uh, make an HTTP call. It could take one second, it could take three seconds. And you have to account for this in your program. That task, the order of task is not guaranteed, of course. So you make a call, and at some point in time, you will return an, uh, your result. Last thing, if you're going to make HTTP requests with async I.O., you have to uh, use this AIO HTTP library uh, in which you have this session uh, context. Um, on line 12, you have to open this AIO HTTP client session. Uh, so you have a single session, and from that client session, you run all your asynchronous tasks. So in our case, we, uh, we thought ah, we want to really brute force all these simulations, and we want to like, let's just start a million concurrent coroutines. Um, I think I forgot to introduce the coroutine uh, concept. Uh, so if you uh, um, prefix your def uh, function definition with async, it will tell, your, uh, it will tell async I.O. this can run in a separate part outside the, the main process. Uh, and this, is, this thing is called a coroutine. So let, uh, if you run many, many uh, asynchronous tasks, uh, you will run many, many coroutines, and they will open a file on your file system. And a file system has a limit to the number of open files. So if you really um, open up too many coroutines, yeah, your uh, machine will uh, not be able to handle them all. Uh, so you have to use uh, some tricks for that. Uh, one uh, included in the async IO library is called a semaphore. Add some notes here. Uh, anyway, uh, so semaphore is basically a limit to the number of uh, coroutines you can have open. Uh, what happens if um, you call a new coroutine? Uh, a semaphore is basically a counter. Um, and when, once a new coroutine opens or tries to open, it will check with this counter, hey, is there still space for me to open a new coroutine on the system? Um, if the counter has reached its maximum, uh, it will basically just block until other coroutines have finished their execution. And once that has happened, then you can start new coroutines. 
So I introduced a couple of tools, uh, a couple of libraries to do some asynchronous processing. Um, let's see what we can do with it. Yeah. So, so at this stage, I'm the evil scientist who just got a whole bunch of resources. So, yay. <laughs> the idea is, before we're going to do anything serious, we're still sort of over-engineering. So let's benchmark some things. Um, I'm going to do a deployment of Lambda. We're just going to start out clean. The idea is, let's just boom, send a thousand things there. Uh, let's just make them sleep so we can sort of really measure the overhead and check how long it takes before everything goes back. And two situations are what you're seeing here. On the x-axis is just the time in seconds. Uh, on the y-axis, you can sort of see um, the first thing we sent out, the second thing we sent out, and all the blue dots are essentially when we've sent stuff out. You notice that there's a bit of, you cannot just send everything immediately. There's a little bit of overhead even in uh, uh, AIO. However, in the lower chart, that's a situation when the Lambda function was just created and we're going to send it traffic for the first time. In that case, you know, it's, it, it's not used to getting a thousand concurrent requests in one time, so it has to spin up a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and this is all the magic that Amazon does for you. Um, you could do some cheeky things, like you can measure the IP address, and you can also measure the thread ID and that kind of thing to try to reverse engineer the way that Amazon does it. It's hard. Um, one thing you do notice, though, the moment that you've done this once, if you then send the second uh, batch of lots of questions, then everything comes back in a more predictable pattern. So there is this notion of a cold state and a hot state in these functions, but you mainly only pay for it the first time you do this, which is fine. I'm willing to wait once. However, we did notice that you know, it's great that I say I want to go at a sushi go, and then I send 1,000 requests from my laptop to the cloud. But I mean, there's going to be lots of network overhead, probably, which is not necessarily a great thing. Uh, what might be better instead is if we start some sort of SageMaker instance or an EC2 instance and just do the command line from there. And we we're just curious in how big the overhead in this could be. And it's massive. The weird thing here is that basically we're waiting for the entire batch to come back. So essentially, you're waiting for the slowest thing to come back. And if you've got a lot of network overhead, it's actually quite sizable. You're waiting more than that you're actually computing something. And you know, this would be the point in time where usually I would give you a live demo, but I'm not going to ask uh, the kind engineer upstairs to do alt tap and do all of those things. So here's basically what we get back when we run the command. Um, I'm sorry it's static, but I can assure you it works. When you run this, you can see in AWS monitoring that you're querying thousands upon thousands of Lambda functions at the same time. The cool thing is we measure how long uh, everything takes on the Amazon side, and we can calculate how long everything takes on our side. So. Oh, uh, this, please. So this is the point in time where I started thinking, ah, yes, let's really get kicking. We can really, you can call AWS, you can get more CPUs and all that's great, so uh, this will be great. However, there's a law in physics. There's this thing called Amdahl's law, and the idea is that if you have a program that 1% of the time cannot do anything in parallel because it has to sync, then actually the speed up, even if you have thousands of cores, it's not going to be thousands. And I'll just take the naive number. Um, this is the way it scales. Uh, if, you ha if I have 1% of time that everything is syncing uh, and I use about 60 cores, then effectively the speed up will only be 40. So what I did is I just looked at the output that I had before. I looked at all the time that stuff is happening on Amazon side, and I looked at all the time that I spend locally. I have my probability that I'm syncing, and when I make a chart of that, then even when I have 10,000 cores, Effectively, this suggests that I would only have 4,000. So this actually got me thinking. Maybe I shouldn't be too optimistic about the speed up. Because, you know, let's, let's apply the math a bit further. And then I came to an even more shocking conclusion. Because if you think about it, if you think back of that chart that I just made, I am not waiting for everything to come back. I'm waiting for the slowest thing to come back. And the more things I send, the larger uh, the waiting time is going to be. The slowest out of 10 is probably not as slow as the slowest out of 10,000. You could do a little bit of math there. You just sort of look for the quantile of the, of the sort of longest tail end of a distribution. So a boring math formula. You, you can you take my word for it if you don't appreciate the maths. But now I said, OK, if I put those numbers in the same chart, it gets bad. We even get to a stage where adding more cores will actually make everything worse which is somewhat counterintuitive, because parallelism is supposed to be better. But it seems that there is some sort of optimum, that I shouldn't be sending too much traffic, because I'll be waiting for overhead more and more. So then you're wondering, 
how can I make this faster? And this is sort of an interesting problem. This is sort of the whole thing about scaling. This is an optimization algorithm, not even a machine learning algorithm. But I would like to find a way, preferably somewhat general, that I can maybe deal with this. Because then I can finally stop using my laptop and I can live my life in the cloud. And if you think about it, this is the problem we had. And the whole point of where everything goes wrong is not the green part, but it's that red bit. Everything has to come back to some sort of central controller, some sort of central process. And that's where all the state gets handled, but it's also the bottleneck. I, that red part has to wait until all the thousands of green parts are done. And then you start thinking, well, if that's the way that you could look at it, then maybe the best performance boost you can think of is to stop looking at this in sort of batches, but to maybe start looking at this in streams. How about I just have some sort of queue where all the simulations happen? And I first start with all of my members that I want to simulate. That's the yellow bit going into the blue bit. Then I still got my trusty old Lambda function that can sort of listen onto the queue, and it can start simulating. And then maybe instead of waiting for like the thousands of things to come back, I can also just say, whenever a new member comes back, is that member part of the 100 best things I've ever seen so far? If so, update the list of best things and generate a new character, put it in the simulation queue. And now, I can still do micro-batching. I mean, there's still some stuff I can optimize. But this is the reason why some of the people say that concurrency is not parallelism, but it may actually be better. Because I'm no longer doing things in huge batches, I think I will no longer have the Amdahl law issue that I had before. It'll at least be a whole lot better. And that's the part where I think the algorithm started hurting a bit. Yes, yeah, space, all right. <laughs> it's a very interesting way of doing a talk. So okay, in terms of the algorithm side, I've considered a bunch of things, and then stuff that I like about this flow, but Boss also had some discoveries on how to optimize this system as well. So Chellis, uh, does a lot of work for you. It takes a lot of work out of your hands. Um, it allowed us to go uh, with a Lambda function and an API gateway uh, up and running within a few minutes. Um, at one point, we started thinking, OK, maybe the call via the API gateway to the Lambdas uh, is a bit, uh, bit of overhead. And we just want to call the Lambda function straight away, directly, without this API gateway. Uh, it turned out to be of a bit of a hacky way to get there. Um, and um, yeah, our main issue with the API gateway was it has this limit for the maximum time of execution, uh, and, uh, which is 30 seconds. After this, your call would just time out. So if um, you make your simulations larger and larger and larger and larger, uh, at one point it's going to uh, cost you, uh, it's going to take uh, over 30 seconds, and then uh, you'll start running into uh, timeout problems. Uh, the maximum time for a Lambda function, however, is five minutes. So we wanted to um, uh, be able to uh, use that. So the problem is Lambda has no URL public to the internet. You cannot just call it straight away. Um, you can, however, use Boto. So Boto is a library to call Amazon APIs. And then via Boto, you can call your Lambda function. However, it does not do asynchronous calls. So it's a bit of an issue when you want to run these uh, kind of algorithms. Uh, there is this project on the internet, on GitHub, uh, called AIO Botacore. It's a, kind of an asynchronous version of Boto, but it's a bit, uh, not everything is supported, so there's a list of a few Amazon services which you can call asynchronous, but they're like sort of half-tested, and there's warnings saying use at your own, uh, uh, your own expense. Um, and also, the nice thing about Chalice and this API gateway is you have, just have to use this app.route decorator. It will create an API gateway endpoint for you and then route your calls to your Lambda function. Um, if you're going to move, uh, move away from the API gateway, you will have to do this routing logic yourself. So it's a, bit, a, lot, of a, wor a lot of work to get this to work. Uh, other point, how about cost? Um, the cloud is uh, basically you pay for what you use, and uh, we want to know, uh, even despite it was our boss's credit card, how much does this experiment cost? Um, so Lambda pricing cost consists of two parts. One, you just uh, pay for an invocation of your Lambda function. Uh, this costs uh, $0.2 dollars per 1 million requests. 
And second, you also pay for the time you use a Lambda function. Um, you pay for blocks of 100 milliseconds. Uh, the price you see here is the cheapest price uh, you can get for a Lambda. You can, uh, with the Lambda, you have uh, this uh, switch. Uh, you can allocate more uh, memory, and with that you get more CPU, but it will also make it more expensive. So with this uh, formula, um, the price for making one million requests uh, to Lambda cost $21. Um, so let's say extremely naive, you were, you were uh, to brute force your entire, uh, all the, the possible combinations of your uh, Sushi Go. Uh, yeah, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. And in that case, maybe just getting a bit, uh, big fat machine to do all the hard work uh, might turn out cheaper. But we also discovered this algorithm converges very, very fast. You don't need to brute force all the two billion combinations. So um, with just a reasonable, uh, reasonable amount of simulations, um, yeah, it would end up uh, costing about $10. Um, and this would uh, basically mean running half a million simulations. Well, yeah, then you're pretty um, confident about uh, having the optimal uh, um, order of cards. So this would co cost you $10. And let's say you have a big fat machine with uh, 64 CPUs, like somewhat equivalent to what you get with uh, Lambdas. Um, if you were gonna run that for 24 hours in Amazon, yeah, it would cost you a little bit more. Or approximately 76 euros, uh, dollars. There's this switch in the Lambda user interface. Um, you can allocate more memory to it. With that, you also get uh, more CPU power. So it's nice because, um, yeah, your simulations will go a little bit faster. Uh, and it's a very CPU bound task that we're running. I think there's a next slide. Yeah. Um, so if we were using the slowest uh, possible Lambda, our, all our simulations uh, would take about, yeah, 20 uh, seconds. But if we raise this uh, number of, uh, if we raise this switch to the maximum, it turned out our lambda ran four times faster. Uh, the number, uh, or the number of seconds it would take will be somewhere between three and a half and five seconds. So this is nice, um, but there's a trade-off. So you pay uh, 10 times more in this uh, example and uh, you get just four times speed up. Uh, there, we did find this optimum uh, where our lambdas would run twice as fast. So you pay half the price. So basically you get uh, to pay uh, nothing extra, but you do get uh, twice the speed up, which was a nice uh, discovery. So you have to kind of try and error with your lambda functions uh, to get the optimal between price and performance. Um, another thing, the default maximum for number of uh, concurrent lambda functions you can have is 1000. Uh, you cannot raise this uh, uh, beyond a thousand, but if yeah, you're nice enough uh, to Amazon and uh, you're willing to explain you want to brute force a card game or run some simulation card game, yeah, maybe they'll raise the number of lambdas for you. So some engineering conclusions, uh, lambdas, yeah, it's not really the use case for a lambda, but it's nice that you can basically outsource your CPU uh, power to the cloud and. Um, yeah, combine this with async IO because basically with async IO, it's um, if you have some IO intensive uh, task, yeah, that's a nice use case for um, um, uh, running asynchronous. But yeah, if your CPU is gonna run con uh, all the time and uh, do some uh, uh, heavy crunching, that's typically not a good use case for running asynchronously, unless you can outsource it to, for example, Amazon, and then you can run concurrently found simulations and just wait until they get back. Um, during uh, our benchmarking, uh, we did discover there's a big difference between hot and cold functions. So lambdas, they uh, have this hot and cold state. If you call a lambda, it uh, will spin up for you if it hasn't done so before uh, from a cold state. And then, yeah, it remains in a hot state for a couple of uh, mo uh, minutes. Um, so if you rerun your benchmarks, you're gonna get uh, different results depending on the state of your Lambda functions. Uh, just a generic 
concept in these genetic algorithms, state is a, a hard thing to handle. If you are going to run many, many simulations at the same time, you, have, you need some way to track your state. And if there's lots of processes uh, running simultaneously, yeah, you might run into some bottlenecks in your algorithm. Also, uh, program with async IO. It can be quite nice for you. The, the basics are pretty easy to get right. But once you're going to get uh, into a bit more um, programming with async IO, it's uh, kind of hard to get the details right. Uh, sometimes there's this, uh, you miss the async or await keyword in your code, and then you think like, hey, my code's running so slow, and it's kind of hard to debug these issues. There's also some scientific conclusions. Yes. Um, so, um, my girlfriend's watching this over the stream, and I suppose that you're all wondering, wow, you've spent so much time optimizing all of these things. Uh, we're doing like concurrent and concurrent things and algorithms and this NP hard and we've totally scaled everything out of this. So obviously, Vincent won. <laughs> nah. <laughs> in fact, uh, what, the, what the kind engineer, if you could move your mouse cursor to the middle of that screen and then click, you should see a play button. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> my, my girlfriend made me show you everyone that. Could you press it one more time just for good measure, please? Uh, <laughs> Oh, back to uh, uh, left arrow, left arrow. Press it one more time, please. Right, right, right. So <laughs> good. My, my girlfriend, who's now watching, is happy. So uh, space bar, next slide, please. Yes, so the truth is, I mean, we love doing this, but we ran both the batching and the more streaming thing. Like, we totally played around with lots of cores. Seeing the numbers go up was f fun. Uh, but unfortunately, we did find out after implementing everything and optimizing a fair bit uh, that the algorithm tends to converge after two iterations anyway. <laughs> um, um, in this case, we did have uh, a lot of fun. Like, we did learn more from the road than the destination because I do think, like, really, um, that we've got a nice little pattern here. And if you want to do more grit kind of stuff, this is actually somewhat powerful. And the costs behind this are actually kind of interesting. So the conclusion, uh, the squid is the best card in Sushi Go. Um, note, though, that our approach is immensely naive. I mean, the game has a rock, paper, scissors element in it. You're totally not going to capture that with a list of cards that you put in a certain order. Um, nevertheless, again, our approach scales well and is fairly cheap. Uh, we might still have a bit of a problem with premature optimization. I think that's fair to mention. But once again, uh, we really did have a lot of fun with this. Um, we really did learn a lot about serverless. We actually gained a concurrency grid pattern, and we learned a lot about async. So if I can give you any advice before you leave today, spend some time with your colleagues, find this very silly problem, and optimize everything. <laughs> Um, so uh, I would also like to have a round of applause for the kind engineer who's been pressing all the buttons upstairs. <laughs> um, uh, and also the, to the ones that weren't here before, there was like a, a kind, someone who's giving a talk here and stuff was completely failing. Be sure you reach out to the previous speaker because it was a bit of a bummer that a lot of these things failed. So uh, reach out to her. Um, we're open for any questions. Yeah, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. So if you, you can come down to the mic or I can run up. If I think this chat was, are you, do you have a question or have you? <laughs> well, we can also, if you Thank scream you. the question, we can also just repeat it. That might be. Uh, Hi, um, that was super entertaining. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Just a, a quick question, actually. I really love the idea of uh, what you were saying about how you guys have a free Friday each month kind of work on stuff, and I just yeah. want to hear a bit more about I, I want that. to emphasize that we agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say I'm going to try to make the pitch when I get back to work. So um, um, do you mind just kind of expanding a bit more how it works, what, what kind of good things have come out of it? I mean, obviously, this is a, is a, is a good one, but uh, yeah, sure. yeah, anything else? Uh, uh, yeah, take yeah. It. All right, I'll take it. Um, so, yeah, so we have once a month, we have, uh, or every four weeks, actually, we have this uh, Friday um, where you do not work for any clients. So everybody goes to the office. And uh, basically, you're allowed to do whatever you want, as long as it's kind of work-related. Um, there's no um, um, uh, mandatory uh, requirements whatsoever. Just go and hack away. Uh, so sometimes people want to pick up a new programming language and they read a book. Uh, sometimes people want to work on a, a hack away on some project like this one. Uh, there's really no requirements whatsoever to do so. Um, and sometimes fun things come out of it, and sometimes you're hacking away for a day, and you think like, ah, 
what have I done today? Nothing's working. Ah, okay, that can all also happen. But it's always fun to learn new things in these days. Uh, and if I can recommend you anything, if you're going to make the pitch to your employer, um, like, if you look at what we've done, I mean, we've spent a, spent a fair amount of time on this, but here's some of the stuff we got out. Uh, we learned a new programming uh, paradigm. Uh, we taught ourselves a bunch of new cloud tools. Uh, and we have a cool talk uh, for a conference. Um, so that's still a return on investment. And you allow yourself just that extra bit of creativity to work on things that you wouldn't otherwise do, which might actually save the day someday. OK, I think we've got time for one more question. I think this if my uh, girlfriend ever wants to play another card game, I'm totally prepared this time. Uh. <laughs> yeah. OK, so quick question. Would you say that you failed because the modeling of the game was uh, flawed? Like, if you change the implementation of the game in Python, would it be better it would uh, work? Uh, that sure didn't help. <laughs> um, but so th again, one thing you have to keep in mind with this, I, you're not allowed to use a laptop while playing the card game. right? So that's a hard limit. So the only thing the algorithm can do is teach you some sort of heuristic, maybe something that you don't know. And again, you could go for the deep reinforcement learning thing, et cetera. But my girlfriend would no longer want to date me if uh, that's how we spend our Sundays. <laughs> um, but definitely, yeah, if you, if you really want to do this properly, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, and also, if you're going to do the algorithm streaming, by the way, the whole genetic portion of the algorithm changes a bit, right? You no longer have population, so there's some numerics you have to Okay, I think we're going to have to wind it up there. Thanks once again, Vincent and Baz. Thank you. Thank you.